just for you to think of on your own. Uh, so I'd like everybody to think about what makes an insect an insect? What characteristics does an insect have to have to be classified as an insect? Um, we'll give it another 30 seconds or so for more people to join and then we'll kick it off. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Digital Drop-In Learning. Um, I'm Michael, um, over uh, practicing social distancing again at my house in our, our little studio here. And today we're talking all about insects. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanted to make sure everybody is um, on board and ready to go with Zoom. Uh, so we'll have a couple different uh, cameras today and I'll be sending it to a field correspondent. Um, but before we do that, we wanna make sure that um, if you are not in speaker view, head on up to the upper right hand corner uh, where it says gallery view or speaker view and you wanna click it so you have just me um, with my awesome Wild Center background so you can see that and then all the, the various uh, PowerPoints and such that I'll be sharing today. If you would like to ask questions and answer questions that I'll ask you, um, we're using the question and answer function. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A with two little speech bubbles. Um, you're welcome to throw any questions in there uh, for myself and our field correspondent. And as we're asking you questions, you can throw your answers in there. Uh, we'll have a, hopefully a fun little game to play uh, right out of the gate uh, to, to work on that. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's go. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll kick off today's daily drop-in or digital drop-in. Um, today is introduction to insects. We're gonna be covering um, some of the basics about what makes an insect an insect uh, and some uh, spotlighting some really awesome adaptations of some local species of insects here in the Adirondacks. Um, insects are incredibly interesting animals. Um, most, are uh, about 90% of, of of animals on the planet are insects, which is crazy, crazy to think about. Um, there are six to 10 million species of insects that we know of. Um, that is so many um, and can be kind of overwhelming if we think of insects, um, as many people think of as pests. But insects do so much more than that. Um, they're effective pollinators. They do some really great ecosystem functions, decomposition. Um, if you uh, check out our lunchtime live from last week with Nicole, um, she's talking all about our domestic beetles we have on site at the Wild Center and the incredible um, uh, ecosystem services that they do by decomposing um, flesh um, of, of dead animals and, and putting that back into the food web. So let's get going. Uh, so we're gonna play a quick game called What's That Insect? Um, your challenge here is to one, figure out if it's an insect or not, and then two, the bonus is to figure out what species you think it is. Um, in this, challenge what is really really important as it is in science is we're going to provide ev provide evidence for our claim so if you think that i'm showing you a hmm a beetle of some sort i want you to write down um is that an insect or not and then what your claim is so what evidence you see on that picture that tells you that it could be an insect what characteristics is it showing or does it have so here we go. These are all pictures I took uh, myself from insects I found around my home. Um, no insects were harmed in the making of these images. Um, I just found insects that hadn't made it through the winter um, and took some microscopic photos of them. So let's get moving. So number one, we'll start off with hopefully one that, that we can, we've seen before. Let's see what we think. What insect could this be or is this an insect? Um, and what clues are we using to help us out in figuring out what this is? Awesome, we have a couple, couple ideas. Um, this is definitely an insect. Um, and this is the abdomen of a wasp. So the, the lower portion of a wasp and we can see um, a little bit of its leg and some other parts of its body, uh, wings and leg down below. Ready for our next option? Next option is not loading. Um, next image is right here, a little bit tougher, a um, little bit larger of an organism, so I could take a smaller, a smaller section of it. Um, do we think this is an insect? And what kind of insect could it be from our clues? About 10 to 20 seconds to think about that. 
Again, you can throw those answers right down um, into uh, the question and answer section. Oh, awesome, we got somebody that nailed it. Um, this is an insect, it's a species of beetle. I've noticed that people are saying it has hairs that seem to indicate that it's a beetle. Um, that legs, the legs are, are, are a great um, characteristic to tell us this, this is an insect. Uh, so uh, this insect here has three legs on one side and three legs on the other side, which is key to being an insect. And uh, Jennifer got this exactly right. This is a, a June beetle or June bug. There's the other side. So we can see the three sets of paired legs and that hard exoskeleton that make it an insect. Um, great. Next up, insect or not, and what could it be? What do we think? Great, we've got a couple people, Aiden's thrown in his idea of what this could be. Got a lot of people saying it's a tick. You're exactly right, this is a tick. Um, this is a nymph for a larval stage of a uh, black-legged tick or deer tick. Um, it is not an insect. Ticks um, have four sets of paired legs and are related to spiders. They're arachnids. Um, so close to insects, they're are all arthropods, um, organisms with, with those exoskeletons, but um, in this case, not an insect, but an arachnid. Next up, this one here. What do we think this could be, insect or not? It's a little bit more abstract. Though there are some pretty good clues on this for what this could be. While you're thinking, um, a writer has asked a question about how long can ticks live. Uh, uh, black legged ticks or deer ticks uh, tend to make it through at least two seasons. Um, so they'll hatch in the spring, live throughout a whole year, and then feed again the next year. So they usually live about two years. Uh, we have a, a bunch of people. Uh, Answering on this one, uh, you are all correct. This is a ladybug, which is an insect. Um, and then if we look to the other side, uh, there's the, the top and the front of our, our ladybug uh, where you'd find its eyes um, and the other sections of its body, its head section up at the top there. How about this one? What do we think this could be? Tried to make them a little harder. We'll see if you all think they're a little harder. Um, is this an insect or not? And then what could it be? Hmm. Did I stump you? <laughs> Ooh, we seem to have some different thoughts on this one. Um, and my, uh, my trick may have worked. So this is an insect. We have a lot of answers that this could be a spider. It's what I was hoping to go for with the legs being curled up on top here. Uh, but there are three sets of legs here. One, two, three. Um, so it has six legs, and this is something that I often find a lot in my home. And let's see if this next image will give us the last clue on what that could be. So it does have wings, six legs, they go around homes a lot. Yes, this is definitely an insect, it's a housefly uh, that I found around my house. Uh, so great job everybody. Uh, thank you all for participating in what makes an insect, or um, name that insect. Uh, so now we're going to look a little bit about what makes an insect an insect. Some of this came up already, uh, but I wanted to plot it out on a couple examples, nice hand-drawn um, examples of some common heterotic insects. Uh, so on the left, over here, on my left, um, you can see some of the different body parts or sections of an insect. Insect. Insects have three sections of their body. They have their head, they have the abdomen in the middle, and then they have their thorax, which is the end here. And you can kind of make that out with the end. So their head on top, abdomen in the middle, and then thorax. And all of those sections of their body are covered in their exoskeleton. So instead of having bones on the inside of their body like we do, um, they have their skeleton on, on the outside, and that doesn't grow with them at all. So what they have to do is as they grow inside their skeleton, they shed it and grow a whole new skeleton periodically. Um, Imagine how much effort that would take um, and the resources that that would take as they continue to build that full new skeleton every time they get a little bit bigger. Um, but it gives them some great strength on the outside of their body, that great armor plating. Um, on the other side of this image, I have some of the smaller components, smaller adaptations and body parts of, of insects. So they typically have antennae on their head. 
Um, those are their feelers where they can feel around um, as they're moving from place to place. They can sometimes uh, smell and taste with them. They tend to have smaller antennae um, if they're smelling and tasting with them. Um, in addition to these larger ones that are used to feeling their surroundings. They have compound eyes. So instead of having eyes like us, um, they have uh, eyes that are made up of a network of smaller light sensing uh, components uh, that essentially weave together an image. Uh, so they may not be able to see clearly, but they can see a larger range of field than, than, than we can as a mammal. Uh, sometimes they have wings, uh, and then they have the three sets of paired legs. Uh, so our ant here has one, two, three, four, five, six legs uh, for three uh, total pairs. Um, so looking at a, a bee, we have the same components. We have the head, uh, the abdomen, the thorax, we have the exoskeleton on the outside, even though they're a little bit fuzzy. And then we have antennae, compound eyes, wings in this case, and then the three sets of paired legs. And then for this dermestid beetle, um, we've got similar components in that very distinct hard exoskeleton covering protecting um, the rest of their body and even their wings in the case of this, this insect here. So with that said, um, we're gonna take it out to our field correspondent, Derek. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and see if I can get him on camera for everyone. There we go. So I'll spotlight to him. Welcome, Derek. Hi, everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining this morning. My name is Derek. I'm the field correspondent um, for this morning's digital drop-in. I'm an education fellow here at the Wild Center. And what I'm going to do this morning in the next couple of minutes is take some of the things that Michael just mentioned in his segment and um, show how you might see them in certain insects here in the Adirondacks, specifically two insects. Um, so if you'll join me for in the next minute, I'm gonna switch over to a different camera and I'll show you some of the amazing features of some insects we'll find in this area and across North America. So I'm gonna jump off my screen and hop over to a different camera. Give me one second. Derek, I don't know if you can hear me, but your the screen is uh, vertical. So if you can adjust your phone a little bit, it should bring it horizontal. Great. Looks great. Derek, we may be having a technical difficulty and cannot hear you. Oh, did I mute myself? There we go. Now we're good. Welcome back. Cool. Sorry, guys, hang in there with us. Um, so uh, I was just mentioning that dragonflies are incredible species of insect, and they've been incredible for a very long time. Uh, we have fossils of insects, um, of dragonflies that are about 300 million years old. Um, but those dragonflies back then were much larger. Their wingspans are about two feet wide compared to the largest we have today, which are about five inches or so, which is still pretty big. But um, the dragonflies that we uh, that used to fly around Earth were much larger. Um, but I'll zoom in on some of, the, some of the examples we have here. This is uh, an example of a dragonfly you might find here in the Adirondacks. And I'll just point out some key features that I think are pretty neat uh, and are worth knowing about these incredible uh, animals, our creatures. So um, as you can see that we have Dragonflies have two pairs of wings. They have a front pair and a back pair. Um, they are paired off so that the, the front pair work together and the back pair work together, but the two pairs work independently of each other. What this does is it gives dragonflies an incredible range of flying motion and control. Um, dragonflies can hover in the air for about a minute at a time. They can stay in one spot. They can fly forward and backwards and go upside down. They're incredibly versatile um, flyers. Um, and that helps uh, them do what they do best, which is hunt. They are a predatory insect species. Um, they fly through the air and grab insects uh, with, their man, with, their, uh, with their feet. They have six legs um, and they don't actually have teeth. So they don't fly around grabbing things with their teeth. They have mandibles. 
So what a uh, 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 dragonfly will do is it'll fly up to speeds of maybe 30 miles an hour in some cases. There are very fast um, dragonflies out there. They will fly through the air, grab um, the insect flying near them uh, with their legs, and then put it directly in front of their mouth or their, their mandibles and start eating away. Um, dragonflies can eat uh, up to about 100 mosquitoes in one day, so they are our friends here in the Adirondacks and across North America. Um, seeing them flying through the air in the evening is probably a good sign because it means they're eating lots and lots of mosquitoes. One of the ways they can do that is their eyes. This is one of the features I want to point out um, that is so incredible about uh, dragonflies. You can't really see that on, in, in my camera here, but um, dragonflies' eyes are incredibly complex. They, com they are comprised of about 28,000 or so telescoping lenses. Um, what this does is it gives the dragonfly roughly 360 degrees of vision. So it can see almost entirely around its, its entire body, up and down. What this does is it lets it, um, you know, spot its prey in a, in a sharp image and much more um, conclusively than even we have in our ability in, of, of vision, our stereoscopic vision. Um, testing of dragonflies' vision has shown that we, we believe they can see colors and moving objects pretty clearly, which is really incredible. Um, if you look at the standard structure of the, of the body, like Michael was saying, um, what we have here is we have the head, the um, thorax, which is kind of the middle section of the body, and the abdomen here, which is very elongated. Um, but dragonflies don't always look like this. They have a larval stage that exists in the water. So um, dragonfly eggs are laid in the water. Their larval stage can last up to about two years. They can just be hanging out in the water, feeding, maturing for about two years until they emerge, and they kind of have this hard exoskeleton that cracks open and out crawls the, um, the juvenile uh, dragonfly and their wings kind of fold out and they dry in the sunlight in the air and then they fly away. Um, and like I said, they eat tons of mosquitoes and bugs and they're, um, they're a, 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 an insect that we should think be more fond of. They, um, they do a lot for ecosystems in terms of um, controlling insect populations that control pests like mosquitoes and deer flies. Um, and they're also just really cool to look at. You'll see them all across North America. Um, one thing I want to point out before I move on to our next insect is that this is a dragonfly. You might see something similar to this flying around in the summer um, this year, known as a damselfly. And they're a bit smaller. They have a, a tinier kind of a blue sheen to them. They are not dragonflies, but they are related. So if you just, that's an important distinction to make. Amplifies are not quite dragonflies, but they are kind of related to each other. So you might see them around here as well. But dragonflies are an incredible insect, and I'm, um, I'm happy I got to spotlight some of their, their cool features. The next insect I'm going to switch over to um, is something you won't find out and about, but you might find it if you look at an overturned log, the best beetle. Um, the best beetle is a beetle you find all across North America. Most of their species, um, live in the tropics, but we do have um, some species that live here in North America. They love living in, um, or their habitat you find them most often in here in the North America is under like a rotting log or a stump. Um, and a best beetle is what we call a decomposer. So in that habitat, they break down organic material and their droppings and um, what they do in, in the eating um, small like micro insects and in, um, flora and fauna is kind of add to the decomposition of organic matter, which is great because that gets recycled back into the ecosystem. Um, and they're also interesting this in their own right in that uh, one of their key features is their ability to make noise. So if you turned over a log in the summertime and you found one of these guys just sitting there, it might be making a sound that kind of imitates a, like a duck. It sounds like a, almost like a quack. I couldn't do it for you here. But if you look it up later, it sounds like it's making a little quacking noise. And that is one of just 14 of the possible noises that these beetles make, um, which is interesting because, and, and worth noting, because that's more than many vertebrate creatures uh, can make. So these are very noisy beetles, and they do that for a number of reasons, communicating um, to, their, to other species, um, to, uh, between themselves and um, other beetles in the ecosystem. Um, they are also remarkably good, good parents. Um, an inter interesting thing about best beetles is that they raise their young uh, through the larval stage when they're small larvae. 
um, all the way until they're uh, adult beetles. And then they go off and find their own log and um, um, the, the process repeats. But they are, it's not common in the insect world, um, such astute parenting, but um, these beetles do it, which is pretty cool. Um, they're also sometimes called a leather beetle because if you look, you can't see it too well, but they are very, um, shine, they have this kind of shine to them. This sort of sleek, shiny um, uh, backing to them is a defense mechanism in some ways. It shows, you know, it's very stark color and contrast against its background. Um, in some cases can say the predators like, you don't want to eat me. Um, I'm kind of this imposing looking creature and I have a tough back shell. Um, but they're also they're called leather beetles, but sometimes you'll hear them called best beetles as well because of their color. Um, they um, all look kind of scary, but they're pretty gentle. Um, there's no evidence really of them being a biting insect in humans if you, if you find one. You know, here at the Wild Center, we don't recommend you pick up any insect um, unnecessarily, but if you did find yourself face to face with one of these beetles, you wouldn't be in harm's way. They, um, they're rel they keep relatively to themselves, which is nice. Um, like I said, you, you'll find these if you uh, are on a trail or you have an, uh, a log, like a rotting log in your backyard or something. Um, you'll find them underneath kind of eating away at the decomposing material and small insects um, under, the, under the logs. Um, they actually have wings, which is interesting, but they don't fly. They prefer to walk. They tec technically have the ability to fly but they don't. Um, it's kind of an evolutionary trait that served, ended up not serving much of a, of a direct use for them. Like most, like a beetle, a lot many beetles have uh, wings and the ability to fly, these guys included, but they don't. So um, those are just some of the features of um, this beetle I wanted to point out. I thought it really interesting. And between these guys and the dragonfly, you can see them both here in the Adirondacks. Um, and what I'm gonna close with really quick is a challenge we have for all of you um, and for this coming week, uh, and that Michael's going to talk about more in a minute, but what we want you to do is to build your own insect. What that looks like can be a bunch of different things. What I've done, I'll show you over here, I have assembled here a couple different types of material with which you can build an insect using the, the, uh, the features that Michael and I have talked about today. Um, and I hope everyone can still hear me okay, but what I've assembled here it's just some straws that I found in the house, some cotton balls, and some pipe cleaners. But this is, these are just three things. And of these three things, I was able to make this guy. This insect here, he's very lovely. I put a lot of work into him. I call him the giant straw-headed beetle. We'd like you to name him, name them as well, who I affectionately call Greg. Um, but this is an example of you taking the concepts we just learned and translating it into an activity, and that's our challenge for you, is to build one of these insects. And we wanna see how you do that. Um, and with more information on that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Michael, um, and I'll join for a Q&A here in a minute as well. So thank you for listening to my uh, information about these incredible insects, and I'll hand it back to Michael. Welcome back, everybody. And thank you so much, Derek, for those spotlights on the, the wonderful um, dragonflies and the best beetles. Uh, so I'm going to bring it back to our, our slideshow so we can give you the rest of the challenge for the day. Uh, so the challenge, as Derek mentioned, is all about creating your own species of insects. So you just learned a little bit about different species of insects that live here in the Adirondacks and, and some that I was able to find around my home. Um, and hopefully have some, some good inspiration for different adaptations that you can add to your insects. So you could kind of think about it as creating like a, an insect superhero, if you will. Uh, so as you create this insect, keep in mind the, the key characteristics of an insect. So the segmented body, that it is three parts, the head, the thorax, the abdomen, that it should have three sets of um, legs, and that it should have antennae um, on its head um, in order to feel around, feel its environment. Um, so when you do this challenge, you can build a model like Derek did. You can write about it, you can draw it. Um, and we challenge you to uh, think a little bit about how it fits into its habitat. So how big uh, this insect is, where it could live, um, what it could eat, what could eat it, and how it fits into the rest of the food web and, and ecosystems uh, around it. 
And you can find this document and other ones at wildcenter.org backslash digital learning. Uh, so if you go to Adaptations Innovative Insects for today, uh, you'll find um, shortly the video uh, from our, our program. You'll find some challenges. So there's the challenge sheet here, in addition to um, another fun little label and insect challenge that I've uploaded. And once you finish your design, whether you're building, drawing, writing, um, you're welcome to upload an image right to our website and we can showcase those in, in future programs, uh, talking about how awesome uh, all of you are as, as, uh, as scientists. Uh, so remember, uh, you can find all of that on wildcenter.org uh, backslash, backslash digital learning. Uh, you can send questions to me at digitallearning at wildcenter.org and then tune in next Thursday, or not next Thursday, Thursday, two days from now, uh, for another invertebrate themed activity. We'll be, we'll be taking it to another field correspondent, uh, learning about something that's not an insect, but is also an invertebrate. So with that said, uh, we can open it up for some questions and thank you all so much for sticking around and joining us for another day of uh, digital drop into learning. Great, so it looks like we have got one question. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to just throw them right into the Q&A. Um, and we'll take a few minutes to answer some of those for you. Um, let's see if I can, and these can be for, for Derek or myself, if you have more questions about insects in general or, or maybe the species that Derek had. I'm here with Greg. Oh, okay, so um, Derek, we have a question for you. Uh, so let me stop spotlighting me so Derek can answer. Um, do. So Derek, why is the abdomen so long on a dragonfly? Did you come across that in your studies? Um, I, I found um, some information on the abdomen and just its, its general structure. Um, the, the reason behind the shape of an animal's body is, is, is very, but a lot, a lot of it comes back to how it serves it to survive in its environment. Um, the, the abdomen of a of a dragonfly is roughly consists usually of about ten segments, um, which contains various organs, and um, um, it's kind of like the the rear of the uh, of the dragonfly. Um, but one of the purposes it serves is that for for mating um, between dragonflies. Um, when dragonflies mate, they have there's like this pairing kind of uh, action that happens that requires them to align with each other and kind of uh, link up with their legs and um, the, the structure of their abdomen and the way that they fly uh, makes that possible. Um, if the dragonfly's abdomen was a different shape, um, it would, they wouldn't be able to link up and, and to be um, like a, a mated pair as, uh, as we see them in the wild. And that's just the way they have, that they have evolved and they have adapted to survive. Uh, that's what I have found in my, my studies of dragonflies. And my, Michael, I'm not sure if you have more information on that. Awesome, I think that, that, was, that was great, Derek. Um, I'm gonna pin my video here. So we had another question from Catherine about ticks and if they have predators. Uh, they definitely do. Uh, many animals can eat ticks, um, but one of the most um, noticeable and most interesting animals that I think that eats ticks is the opossum. Uh, so the opossum will, um, not only is it immune to Lyme disease, but it will actually pick ticks off its body and eat them uh, as it goes throughout its, its, its life. Um, so it can eat quite, a great number of ticks uh, throughout its life. Great, um, we've got a couple more questions about dragonflies. Um, I'm gonna get to another question here about the, the challenge. Uh, so Jennifer has asked, can you make the bug out of any material? Yes, you're welcome to make it out. Um, if you do a, a build a design or build a model of an insect, um, you can make it out of anything you have around your house. Um, I would ask permission first before just grabbing a bunch of things, um, but uh, really, the sky's the limit, and your creativity is the limit for that. Great. Um, Derek, if you, we, there was another one about dragonflies. Oh, um, I'm going to send it back to you, Derek, for a question from Alton. And if dragonflies bite, if you know that they're, ooh, they're known for that. Yeah, so um, I mentioned it in my video that um, dragonflies, they don't have a mouth or teeth as we know them. They have what we call mandibles, these two kind of long pinchers. Um, that are usually tucked un underneath their head until it's time for them to bite something and then we'll shoot them out and grab it and like start chewing away. Um, but while they do have those and they're not generally very large compared to their body, um, all animals, e everything with a mouth can bite in a sense, um, but uh, dragonflies aren't known for biting. So if you find one and one lands on you, 
You don't have to worry about being an imminent, you know, imminently bitten necessarily. But um, they, they can bite, but um, they only do it as a last resort. So if you find one and it lands on your shoulder or your shirt or something, it's not there to bite you. Um, it has the ability to, and the larger the um, dragonfly, perhaps the, the larger its bite might be. But um, you, wouldn't, you don't have to worry about uh, dragonfly biting you if you encounter it in the wild. Awesome. We have a, another one about dragonflies, so I'll just see it with you, um, Derek. Um, why do dragonflies eat other insects, even though they are an insect from Aiden? Good question. Yeah, so that's an interesting, you know, um, dragonflies are insects themselves, but they are, they're predatory insects. So they, they require the protein and nutrients from other living creatures to survive. And based on their size and their ability and their hunting abilities, that diet mostly consists of other insects smaller, about the same size that they are. And actually, um, in the larval stage, when the dragonfly larvae live in the water before they emerge and fly away, um, they are in some in cases, if, if uh, food is scarce, they will eat other dragonfly larvae in the, um, in the water with them. So yeah, not the, you know, they'll, they're opportunistic hunters. They'll eat what they need to, to, stay, to, to stay alive. Um, so that's kind of why they, the short answer is they have to. They have to eat other insects. That's, their, that's what they hunt, and that's what their lifestyle is built around. Awesome. Also from, from Aiden, I guess I'll, I'll take this one. Um, Aiden has asked, how many species of insects are there? Um, there are, um, from what we know of, anywhere between six and 10 million different species of insects. They're the most numerous um, group of animals um, on the planet, um, since they, they are around such a large portion of the planet and then so many different um, uh, ecosystems and niches and stuff and such within around the globe. Um, so there are, there are many, many, many species and we may not know of all of them yet, which I think is fascinating and, and such a great area of study and why entomology is so, such a, a great field of science to study or the study of insects. Um, so we've got a couple other questions about ticks um, and I figured I would take those and then we've got a couple more questions about dragonflies and we can send it back to Derek. Uh, so, a uh, rider has, has asked, can a tick hurt you? Um, typically, the tick itself um, would not really hurt you. Um, I have uh, been bitten by ticks and have, um, I had an allergic reaction to the bite. Uh, so I suppose that in that way, just like you have an allergic reaction to a mosquito bite and then it itches, um, that, that could be a, a, a way that it could hurt you or, or cause you some discomfort. Um, but the, the issue with ticks mostly is that they can have bacteria in their body um, that can, can cause us to get sick over time. Um, so the big one with ticks would be the black-legged tick and Lyme disease and how um, that, that can cause issues if you don't catch it early and, and how um, that can uh, harm us over time. But really with ticks, it's just being aware that they are around, they're out um, in the forests and, and, and in various environments. Uh, throughout New York State and throughout North America, um, and really knowing that if you do go out for a hike, it's good to take check, um, take a tick check uh, when you get back. Whether you can get a family member to help you out, or just make sure to check check your legs and arms and um, other places. Usually, like right around the neck is a place that they like to go, uh, just to keep an eye out for them um, and be aware that they could be there, uh, but not necessarily something to be terrified of going outside because there are ticks there. Um, they are fascinating animals. They're not my favorite arachnid, which brings us to our next question about what other creatures are in the families of ticks and spiders. Um, but uh, they, they are, um, are one to, to know is around. Um, so we had a question uh, from Maddie, I believe, uh, about what creatures are in the family of ticks and spiders. Uh, so arachnids um, encompass spiders, ticks, scorpions, and recently my favorite species of invertebrate, the horseshoe crab. Uh, which used to be off on their own. Um, uh, Calicerate arthropods, for those of you that like nerdy terms, um, but now they are, are arachnids. So two of my, my favorite animal and maybe my least favorite animal with the ticks are both in the same group of animals, which I think is kind of funny. Um, great, great questions, everybody. So I'm gonna send it back to Derek uh, for a couple more dragonfly questions. So I see a like question about, from, from Naomi about how many types of dragonflies there are. Um, here in North America, we have about, we have identified over 5,000 different species of, of um, 
dragonflies. But many of those live in the tropical areas of Central America, um, in Mexico, um, in the United States and Canada, we've identified about 450 species of dragonfly. So there's a lot out there. And it's not really, it's, they move so fast and very often, very, not very often you see them kind of by themselves. So um, uh, it's kind of hard to tell which is which unless you really look at them closely um, up close. But we have about 450 of them here in North America that, that we might see um, in, our, in our country and in North America. Um, and then another question someone asked, Kelly asked, um, what kind of insects do dragonflies eat? Like I mentioned before, they're opportunistic hunters, so they'll eat kind of whatever insect is available and able to be um, hunted by, by them. But um, they are a very effective mosquito eaters. Um, they eat up to 100 mosquitoes in a night. Um, if they are lucky and they can catch that many as they fly around. Um, there'll also be other small flying insects, flies and uh, deer flies, especially if anyone is from the Adirondacks or this area, you know, in the summertime, mosquitoes and deer flies and things like that, black flies are big pests. And all of those are uh, potential meals for a dragonfly. So um, they eat kind of anything they can get their mandibles around, so to speak. So uh, let's see if there's another uh, dragonfly question. Do dragonflies eat other dragonflies? I guess they do. Fly up, they, um, you know, if, if you're the unfortunate smaller species of a dragonfly who's found themselves in the path of a larger one, um, it is very likely that that dragonfly would not pass up a meal just because um, they're related. Uh, doesn't that courtesy does not extend to the dragonfly world? So um, they will definitely eat other dragonflies if given the chance. Good question, Kelly. And um, what eats dragonflies? Good question as well. Um, bird, uh, any flying in, because dragonflies are, are, are flying creatures, um, anything that can really catch them that is able to eat them and needs protein in some form. So um, uh, dragonflies are subject to predation or, you know, they, they're hunted by uh, animals like birds, um, um, larger insects, perhaps spiders, if they're able to get caught in a spider's web. Um, the dragonflies like are um, an insect or a source of protein for lots of other animals. So anything that can kind of catch them and, and that needs to carnivorously eat, um, consume protein, um, is a potential uh, predator of a dragonfly. So birds and spiders and so forth. Good question, Aiden. We have some, some more questions about insects biting people and, and other arthropods, uh, ticks uh, biting people. Um, so not all insects bite. Uh, so if you think of something like a butterfly, uh, they have a proboscis that they use to uh, feed, um, at least when they're adults. Uh, depends on the species, but they're, since insects are so diverse, there's so many different kinds and so many specific adaptations, some definitely are, have evolved to bite things, um, whether they're eating another animal, eating um, plant matter and, and um, things that are decomposing, or um, they've evolved to uh, consume blood of other animals and get their, their, their energy and, and nutrients and such that way. Um, there's a huge range in, in, in what they're, they're eating um, and or biting if they're, they're doing that at all. Um, we've got a question uh, from Kelly about uh, do ticks uh, like to bite people? Uh, so with ticks, uh, they, uh, at least black-legged ticks, feed only three times, maybe even two. I think it's... Don't remember off the top of my head. They feed two or three times. Either way, it's a very low number on um, the amount of times they feed in their whole life. Uh, so typically, um, there are three life stages for a, t a tick. Um, when they hatch, they're a, a little nymph form um, or a larvae form. They'll feed at that stage to uh, change into the juvenile, kind of like the teenager uh, tick, which would be the, the um, larval form or nymph form. Um, and then from there, um, they feed one more time to become an adult. Uh, so they're feeding between the two, the, th the, the two feedings between the life stages. And then once they're an adult, they feed one more time to get that energy to reproduce. Um, and those feedings, they are all, they have evolved to, to um, uh, feed off of other animals, whether they're humans, mice, deer, um, whatever, birds, um, they're, they're feeding off of the blood and that's what they're utilizing to really have their energy and, and do what they, they need to do to survive. Um, so it's not necessarily them, them liking to bite or, or eat other things, it's whatever they come across. Um, ticks can't jump, so they tend to stay in areas where 
it, it's a little bit more moist. So the leaf litter uh, along the side of a trail or, or in the forested areas. Um, and then they, uh, at various points in the year, will do something called questing. So they'll climb up on, a, on whatever they can find, a little branch or a little blade of grass. They'll stick out their front legs, uh, which have silk on them, just like a spider, except the spider silk is at the other side. The ticks have spinnerets on their, their front um, legs and they can use those to stick onto whatever they need to, and then that's where they would feed. Uh, so we can take a couple more questions here. I wanna make sure everybody has time to get over to lunchtime live at noon in just about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, but we'll take a couple more questions, and I wanted to thank you all for sticking around and learning a little bit about um, some of the wonderful insects that we have here um, in, in the Adirondacks. Questions? I kind of talked about that one. Um, Colleen has asked, uh, how old are ticks? Uh, so an individual tick likely is only between about one and two years old, um, or hatching and, and two years old. So they don't get much older than that. Um, Naomi asked, how many baby ticks hatch at, at one time? Um, with many species of insects, they're laying as many eggs as they can. Well, ticks aren't insects. Um, but they're similar in that regard in that they lay a large amount of eggs and then they all hatch. So when a tick hatches um, or when ticks hatch, it would be hundreds to thousands at once and not many of those will survive to make it to the adult stage. And not any of those actually would have Lyme. So in the, the youngest stage of ticks, they haven't fed at all yet. So they haven't picked up uh, the bacteria Lyme uh, from anything in the environment yet. Okay, so um, on behalf of, of Derek and myself, Michael, I'd like to thank everybody for sticking around, asking some really great questions. There are a couple here um, that honestly you've stumped the naturalist on. So where cockroaches were discovered in the rarest species of insect, um, were a couple questions that we got in that I wanted to, to recognize that honestly, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. So I challenge you all to try to figure that out, what the rarest species of insect is um, it could be one that we don't even know exists yet. So we may not even know what the rare species is. And then uh, where cockroaches are discovered, there are different species of cockroaches around the globe, um, but uh, it's escaping me where uh, they were discovered and where their, 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 their original range of cockroaches is. Uh, so Michael. two challenges, I guess, we can add to your constructed insect challenge for, for the day. Michael, uh, I think, I think the again. rarest insect is um, the, um, the great straw-horned beetle, actually. There's only one in the world, so this is the rarest. <laughs> the rarest species. Yeah. And maybe the ones you make will be the rarest species as well with your creativity, <laughs> everybody. Uh, so thanks again for tuning in to uh, Digital Drop Into Learning, and hopefully we'll see you all on Thursday for uh, another um, amazing invertebrate. Uh, have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you later. <laughs>